iets moeten doen. Verstaan? Het lijkt me wel als, 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 als nou Hollywood of dan, als je Hollywood is, verstaan? Ja, ja. Dat is ons leven, dat is ons brood. Daar is niet alle leven op alle brood. Die, die water die achter mij, die blauwe water. Daar zal ik weer tot de lente van daar. Daar zal ik dood gaan. Lobster, vis. Het was de food of the poor people. Nowadays, sometimes we have to steal our own food. When news broke that crayfish stocks in trouble, it definitely put a dark cloud over, over the community. Small scale fishers in South Africa, they're in crisis, they're grieving. They stigmatize our small scale fishers as poachers. We had to fight to be recognized. The poaching component has got virtually out of control. It is big business among criminal gangs. It's greediness and the one who suffers as a result of their greediness is the small scale fishes. It's something that needs to be addressed because it's not going to go away. Vandaag van ik kreeg ik kan het niet bekostigen, maar destijds. In our harbour, there was one big factory. It was the fish mill factory. For us, it's old memories, you know. That's where our fathers, our grandfathers, our grandmothers have worked. One thing about that factory, it was, it was so smelly. And some of the tourists have complained about the smell. You know, but the locals, the smell they have informed us and they have told us, you know, about life in the harbour. For example, when the smell wakes us up, we know there's fish in our community. We know very soon the big fish will come, the snook will come, the smell tells us that. And we can go down, you know, to the factory, looking at the boats coming in full of fish. But unfortunately, it has closed down, you know. For many reasons, it has closed down. And it has changed now to a potato factory. But here it has changed. Here it has changed. You know, one thing of this coastal villages, there were food everywhere. We never go hunger. For some kids, there was, you know, this beautiful cars and the trains to play with. How we play with rock lobster. I never thought of, you know, my food as an export, a prime export. For me, it was just, if I'm hunger, I'm go catch some and I eat some. That was life. I miss that life. I miss that life. I'm going to be talking to somebody from the WWF's SASI program, a sustainable seafood program, Pavitre Pile, about the fact, good morning, Pavitre, that um, morning, the, the West Coast rock lobster is now a red-listed species. Absolutely, John, and it's rather unfortunate assessment throws it smack bang 
in the very red category. And what that means is please, please don't buy it, don't eat it, don't dry it, don't catch it, because it's in serious, serious trouble. There's some really critical conservation concerns around the species. And not just the species, I mean, a lot of rock lobster is caught by what we call small-scale fishes. So their livelihoods are also in trouble. It's like uh, someone who has no identity, being a small-scale fisher, living in a shed, can't prove income. It's a hard life. These fishing communities are in dire straits. They're grieving because their fishery is in serious decline. They're grieving because of all the social ills connected to this. But the fishery is part of who they are. I was born 1966 in July in Lambert's Bay. I'm a third generation fisher. The only income was in December, November, lobster season. High value species. Only for those who own the quotas, not for my part, but okay. This was the only time when there was actually a steady income in the house. I can see that my family was struggling. I asked him, can't I go with you, Dad? It's really what you want to do? I say, yes, I want to go out there. I want to do something for the family. And so my dad said, okay, you can come on board. It was so a nice feeling out there. The blue ocean surrounded me and I became a fisherman. The, the, the salt waters were in my veins and I, I fell in love with the ocean. <laughs> when we move in on this plot, the first thing I have to do is about this one, because I'm familiar with the sex. But this time it's not for people to stay in or to sleep in. It's not a shelter for humans, but a shelter for my, for my tools. It's a bit rough, because the kids use it for their old toys. And, but as you can see, hoop nets. And yeah, this is my boat. This is my boat. Uh, my source of income, my, the one that feeds my children. Morgen, buta, lekker geslaap. For Lambert's Bay as a whole, most of the fishes rely on the lobster. Because this fishery is so connected to the livelihoods of these fishers and a fishing community that can definitely be considered as poor and marginalized, closing the fishery is not an option. What happened with Race Coast Rock Lobster is much of the damage was actually done 50 years ago. It was very heavy commercial exploitation in the 50s and 60s. That's what pulled the population way down. We've been down to just a few percent of the abundance that we had historically. While we've been trying to get the population up from this 2%, in the last couple of decades, the poaching component has got virtually out of control. For this season, we anticipate poached cash will be almost double what is allowed legally. It is now big business among criminal gangs. It's a high value commodity and high value commodities unfortunately more often than not attract high levels of what we call IUU fishing, so illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing activity. The IUU component of West Coast rock lobster fishery in South Africa is substantial. That's the single most acute problem in this fishery which we need to tackle. When you kind of deconstruct it, it's along that continuum. You have a small-scale subsistence fisher who won't stick to his or her permit because they just need to put food on the table. There's that component. But what we have in the South African lobster fishery coming from our abalone fishery is an organized poaching setup with lots of different players harvesting a large amount of lobster illegally. There's guys who come in with drugs and encourage the youth to go to see and poach some lobster just for drugs and they making big money. 
And the issue is in this particular fishery, that not only goes into an opaque, undocumented market, a lot of that product actually ends up in formal markets, the product being exported out of South Africa that's illegal, but through a formal channel, which is hugely surprising. Why we are concerned is we don't have any hold at the moment on the amount of illegal lobster that is being taken up in the local market. The pearly, the abalone, the nets get tighter on that abalone poaches. So their focus turns to the lobster. And so they target the west coast where the lobster stays in. That's where all the things go wrong. They kept our fishes in captivity. Small-scale fishers in South Africa who sell their resource are often linked to the wrong market incentives in the sense that they are price takers, they don't have negotiating power at the harbour. The difficulty for small-scale fishers is that they really are trapped in a cycle that they can't break out of, where potentially there's huge amounts of market manipulation through the structures that have been set up whose incentives are very different to those who are looking to rebuild a stock. We call it the marketers come in. They will come pre-season. They know that at that time, nothing concrete happens in this fishing village. And the fishermen sits on their stoops, wondering whether the sea will be getting better, hoping for fish to bite. And so the marketer come and said, you uh, some money. Here's an advance on your, on your lobster permit. Uh, there's a 2,000 rent and you need it. There's nothing going on in your house. And you sign off. You sign off your lobster allocation for the season. You begin with the achterstand. As the season begins, then is your reach in the is. It's not your lobster anymore. It's not your allocation anymore. It's the market. Marketers see the opportunity to make a lot of money out of the fishermen and left you with the cramps. They keep fishes in that vicious circle of poverty and that's our main challenge. Yet there is technology available to really try and break out of the cycle, to showcase that there is potentially a different way to do this. And that's what we at Abalobi have obsessed about for the longest time. How do we engage with these fishing communities? How do we make sure that the market and the fishing communities connect with one another to really craft and articulate a journey towards sustainability? If we want to tackle this, we need to bring in traceability and transparency in this fishery and the supply chain. We are able to now pilot that in a really difficult fishery like the West Coast Rock Lobster Fishery. August 2015, we launched a program, Abalobi. Abalobi is the cause for fisher. I feel like I have a no hope for the fishers. There is no stem for the fishers. I have something to stand, I have data. If there are a group of willing fishers who want to try and break out of that cycle, we can actually put tools in their hands to enable that. They're simple technologies, but they're integrated and interconnected. So you can actually trace the lobster from where it was caught all the way across the supply chain. This is a tracking device. I put it on the boat. Whenever I'm in danger or get lost at sea in this mist, there is someone who has my location who can guide me. But then it also offers the benefit of being a tracking tool. The West Coast rock lobster is harvested in certain zones. Being able to verify fishing in your allocated zone is important. My grandfather was a fisher and also my father, so I'm a third generation fisher. Most of what I know about the sea, my dad taught me. I believe the indigenous knowledge of the fishes 
that's what, what guides you. Then for a lobster to grow to an adult, it's a lot of years. For my experience, it's 21 years for a small lobster to grow. Okay, size. Put it in the... First and foremost, no matter if it's size or not, it's bearing eggs. The sea has to produce a lot of, lot of smaller lobsters, so it's best to put her back into the water. The non fishes it doesn't really depend on the sea for an income. They come and destroy the oceans. It's greediness, and the one who suffers as a result of their greediness is the small-scale fishes who make a living out of the sea, who earn the money out of the sea, and who feed the children out of the sea. Once the West Coast rock lobster is landed at the landing site, it is critically important on that day and at that time to record what it is that you actually harvested. I'm going to the app Abba Lobby Fisher, then I will record my catch. How many lobster as well as the weight? We've developed the Abba Lobby monitor tool and quite often this is used to verify or as an additional data stream to that coming from the Abba Lobby Fisher. From a chef perspective, we've developed the Abalobi Marketplace, which is really their window into a small-scale fishing community. The full traceability that we're able to have with the Abalobi app um, and through the Marketplace app is incredible. I mean, never before have you actually been able to trace the fish back to its true origin. After the wing of the fish, we're packing the fish, we close the box, I take a picture of a special barcode and we seal it. And they've got an individual tag on it. So at any point you can link that cooler box that's transporting that West Coast rock lobster with a unique tag to the unique ID of the fisher log that was generated by the fisher that went out to sea. I accept the new job. Tracking where the vehicle went is equally as important, making sure that you can get the fish from where it was landed to the chef in the shortest possible time. But also making sure that there is nothing in the track that's potentially suspicious. A beautiful, neat cooler box of crayfish arrives, packed on ice, um, fresher than you could ever get from any traditional supplier. Once the chef has unpacked the box, counted the lobster, weighed the lobster, verified that it correlates with all the other information. And he will look at the box, look at the barcode, and then he will sign off as receiving the box that was loaded at the harbour. You get a, a link in the app to pay. You can exactly see what amount actually goes to the fisherman for his beautiful product that he's delivered to you. And that's really heartwarming to know that he's being rewarded fairly for the beautiful product that he's delivered. But then it doesn't end there. The chef's order code is then linked to a QR code, which he can present to his patrons, which is dynamic. The client that eats the lobster in the restaurant uh, scan the QR code and can see who gets the lobster. In the minute they open it and they read the story, their faces light up. They'll tell me like, oh, we just sent the guy a message to say the fish was amazing. You can thank the fisher for that directly. Basically send a message to the fisher and their community to say, you know what, you're visible to me as an end consumer. I know a little bit about you, I know a little bit about your community, and I know how important it is to you to harvest and celebrate this West Coast Rock Lobster. Yeah, I received lots of messages from happy customers. So it's only compliments. Make me blush. <laughs> If we think about sustainability in South Africa as consumers, we often think you know, we can already choose sustainability. But overall, especially in terms of fisheries, we're not there yet. 
We need to look at the carbon footprint in the supply chain. We need to look at the kind of the ecosystem effect of the fishery. We need to look at the socioeconomic dimension of the fishery and the supply chain. And so what we're trying to achieve by working with fishers using platforms like Avalobi is kind of really navigate towards sustainability, from traceability to market empowerment, collecting data to develop fisheries improvement program, and slowly but surely kind of really crafting what sustainability looks like, with the hope to build a movement, to build a movement of fishing communities kind of really putting their foot on the ground and kind of taking, taking their step into rebuilding this fishery, into rebuilding their communities. I believe in the cliché that says good things come to those who wait. And sustainability for me is key. I stay nearly my entire life in a shack. I can't provide in a payslip. I, I do have an income, but I can't prove my income. And Abalobi gives me that security. Abalobi says, you can create your own payslip. You can have a sustainable income. You know that in Lemmers Bay, because of Abalobi, we've got the only running small-scale fishing office in the Western Cape, where people sit around on a monthly basis and they discuss the data that they've collected. Fishers discuss the impact of climate change on their livelihoods. Abalobi is a tool allow them to collect data and that data that they collect have empowered them to being their own voice. I work the rest of the fishermen who are now still waiting for Salina to come and they have to in the new year with Abalobi after the Through Abalobi, I can feel that I am moving somewhere. I can see me and I fish a circle of poverty. And it's one of the challenges to, to try and reform fishes in a sense that they can take responsibility for the species and the responsibility of their own life and to put themselves in control. It all starts with a small West Coast Rock Lobster pilot, four or five willing fishers, a few willing chefs. Let's step outside of the norm and see if we can test something that can actually break cycles which have been entrenched and are driving this fishery potentially towards collapse. And we need to do that now. I can understand the concern in the consumer's mind, especially thinking of something at the verge of collapse or extinction, but it's not a case of making a blanket call. It needs a different approach. One needs to look at it in small pockets instead of one big problem with one solution. And that's what I think um, Avalobi is doing brilliantly. Acceptance by the local market that they are going to only take lobsters in this case, which can be traced back to legal operations. We do have the beginnings of a process which hopefully can get the poaching under control. So when you get a lobster, whether it's being consumed locally or whether it's exported, you can be sure of where it came from and that the source it came from is legal. Traceability is kind of the precursor to sustainability. Small-scale fishers in South Africa using Amalobi are engaging and embracing traceability, are really kind of taking that traceability concept into their supply chain. All of this happens within kind of a very rigid data framework that allows for reconciliation, that allows for mass balance, it allows for us to really make sure that there's no opportunity for illegal lobster to enter these supply chains. We need to scale that, of course. We need to scale that and we need to work with many fishing communities along the coastline to really own these platforms and use their own version of it to kind of address their own challenges. My hope is that the courage that fishers like David and other fishermen and women have in terms of sort of taking a first step and kind of showing the world really how they are the stewards of our resources. 
that that really takes, that takes with the public, that takes with, uh, with other stakeholders, because I think that's our starting point. How do we legitimize fisheries management? How can we legitimize fishery rebuilding planets by working with champions like, um, like David? I believe that we, as small-scale fishers, all of us, are the custodians of the ocean. My hope is for every fisher to become a responsible fisher, to take ownership of the ocean and the species in the ocean for the next generation. And I strongly believe that the Abalobi, as a tool, we can achieve it.